Hey everyone, and welcome to Hunter Bible Church Online. My name is Jason, and if you're here watching online for the first time, we would love to know that you are here. Now let us know that you're here by shooting us a text to the number on the screen below. Uh, now we've actually had lots of people join our church through this process, and we really hope that if you live locally, uh, that you might join us in person also. Now one of the things we do here at church when we gather is we proclaim the gospel to one another. Now, obviously, as we watch online, we lose a bit of that one another aspect of church. So we want to encourage you, even if you are in lockdown, to engage with someone about the talk, the songs, the interviews, or whatever it might be. Why don't you shoot a friend a text message to, to let them know that you're here uh, watching church, even though you couldn't be there physically at the moment. But a good question to ask is, what is this gospel that we proclaim? Now, gospel just means good news. So what is this good news that we proclaim? Now we've been looking through the book of John and we've had the opportunity week in and week out to reflect on who Jesus is, his identity and the work that Jesus has done through his death on the cross. And throughout the book of John, there are so many clear articulations of this good news that we believe and strive to live out in our lives. Now for a snapshot into what it is that Christians believe, John chapter three, is a great place to go. In verses 16 to 18, it says, For God so loved the world that He gave His one and only Son, that whoever believes in Him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through Him. Now, whoever believes in Him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already, because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. Now, what we believe here at Hunter Bible Church is salvation by faith alone. It is believing in Jesus. That means we are no longer condemned, but can have eternal life. Now, let's sing some songs about these great gospel truths.
from John chapter 9, verses 1 to 41. Now, as he went along, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, 
who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Now, neither this man nor his parents sinned, said Jesus. But this happened so that the works of God might be displayed in him. As long as it is day, we must do the works of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. While I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Now, after saying this, he spit on the ground, made some mud with his saliva, and put it on the man's eyes. Go, he told him. Wash in the pool of Siloam. This word means sent. So the man went and washed and came home seeing. His neighbors and those who had formerly seen him begging asked, Isn't this the same man who used to sit and beg? Some claimed that he was. Others said, No, he only looks like him. But he himself insisted, I am the man. How then were your eyes opened? They asked. He replied, The men they called Jesus made some mud and put it on my eyes. He told me to go to Siloam and wash. So I went and washed, and then I could see. Where is this man? They asked him. I don't know, he said. They brought to the Pharisees the man who had been blind. Now the day on which Jesus made the mud and opened the man's eyes was a Sabbath. Therefore, the Pharisees also asked him how he had received his sight. He put mud on my eyes, the man replied, and I washed, and now I see. Some of the Pharisees said, This man is not from God, for he does not keep the Sabbath. But others asked, How can a cedar sinner perform such signs? So they were divided. Then they turned again to the blind man. What have you to say about him? It was your eyes that he opened. The man replied, He is a prophet. They still did not believe that he had been blind and had received his sight until they sent for the man's parents. Is this your son? They asked. Is this the one you say was born blind? How is it that now he can see? We know he is our son, the parents answered. And we know he was born blind. But how he can see now or who opened his eyes, we don't know. Ask him, he is of age. He will speak for himself. His parents said this because they were afraid of the Jewish leaders who, or, who, er, who already had decided that anyone who acknowledged that Jesus was the Messiah would be put out of the synagogue. That was why his parents said, He is of age. Ask him. A second time they summoned the man who had been blind. Give glory to God by telling the truth, they said. We know this man is a sinner. He replied, Whether he is a sinner or not, I don't know. One thing I know, I was blind, but now I see. Then they asked him, What did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? He answered, I have told you already, and you did not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you want to become his disciples too? Then they hurled insults at him and said, You are this fellow's disciple. We are disciples of Moses. We know that God spoke to Moses, but as for this fellow, we don't even know where he comes from. The man answered, Now that is re remarkable. You don't know where he comes from, yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners. He listens to the godly person who does his will. Nobody has ever heard of opening the eyes of man born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. And to this reply, they replied, you were steeped in sin at birth. How dare you lecture us? And then they threw him out. Jesus heard that they had thrown him out. And when he found him, he said, Do you believe in the Son of Man? Who is he, sir? The man asked. Tell me so, that I may believe in him. Jesus said, You have now seen him. In fact, he is the one speaking with you. Then the man said, Lord, I believe. And he worshipped him. Jesus said, For judgment I have come into this world, so that the blind will see, and those who see will become blind. Some Pharisees who were with him heard him say this and asked, What? Are we blind too? Jesus said, If you were blind, you would not be guilty of sin. But now that you claim you can see, your guilt remains. Clear sight is very important. Now, you might think that's obvious, but like most things in life, I learned that lesson the hard way. See, in my life, I've split my head open five different times. 
which if you know me at all, might explain a few things about why I am the way I am. And the worst of these times was when my neighbor threw a half broken boomerang into my head and it just lodged in there. That one scared me, the, that one scarred me the most physically. But emotionally, the one that scarred me the worst was this one right here on the crest of my forehead. This is a scar that comes from broken trust and utter betrayal. See, where I grew up, in the house I grew up in, there was this long, narrow hall with bedrooms kind of coming off it all along the way. And this one time I was with my brother, Ben, when he suggested that we play a game together, where I kind of tried to walk along this hallway with my eyes shut. And he'd keep saying, just move a little bit to the left, move a little bit to the right. And he'd guide me up this path in a straight line. Now, obviously that sounds like a pretty lame game, right? But you've got to remember growing up in, in Dubbo, there was not a lot to do. So you had to find ways as kids to entertain yourself. And it turns out that this game was very entertaining, but more so for my brother than it was for me. See, as I walked along the hallway that day, my brother called out slightly to the left, slightly to the left, just a little bit more to the left, until suddenly, crack. I plowed straight into the corner of our bedroom wall and my head split open and blood poured down my face. Now, I learned two very important lessons that day. One is you should never, ever trust your older brother. And two, clear sight really matters. And in our passage today in John chapter 9, this is precisely what Jesus wants us to learn. Not that you can't trust your older brother, but that nothing matters more in this life than your ability to see. You see, in John chapter 9, Jesus and his disciples come across a man born blind. He's blind from birth, we see there in verse 1. So Jesus and his disciples, they're on their way out of the temple in Jerusalem, where they've been celebrating this festival pre-COVID, of course. It's called the Jewish Festival of Tabernacles, sometimes the Festival of Booze. And this festival, it's a time when the Israelites would come together and they would feast and sing and dance late into the night under the light of these four great lanterns which lit up the temple, the place where God dwelt. And it's as they leave this festival, they leave this celebration under these lights that they come across this man who was blind from birth. And he's outside at this point because he's excluded from the party. He's, he's forced to beg outside the temple grounds because of his blindness, because they think he's a sinner. That's why the disciples ask that really weird question there in verse 2. They say, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Now, that question seems a little bit strange to us today, doesn't it? But in the context of the Jewish culture, it makes total sense. Because physical blindness was seen by many of the Jews as an indication that a person had been cursed by God, that they were under his judgment, presumably for some sin in their life or the life of someone close to them. And so because this man here was blind from birth, Presumably, the disciples think that either his parents must have sinned or he himself somehow sinned why he was still in the womb before he was born. Now, when you stop and think about it, that does raise a few questions, doesn't it? Is his blindness presumably this curse from God? Did this start, that started before this man was born, is it his fault or is it his parents' fault? that he's born like this. In other words, what they're asking here is, Jesus, how does this whole blindness that's caused in the womb before birth work? And it's an interesting question from the perspective of an Israelite who believes that this blindness is a sign of God's judgment. But Jesus says in this case, it's the wrong one to ask. Jesus says in this case, something different is happening. See, in the scriptures, 
we do see examples of people's personal sin resulting in some specific judgment in their life. It, it can happen, but it's definitely not the rule or necessarily the norm. And in this case, Jesus says, it's not this man or his parents' sin that caused him to be blind. Now look at what he says there in verse three. This is Jesus' response. He says, neither this man nor his parents' sin, said Jesus, but this happened so that the works of God might be displayed in him. And he spits on the dirt, he makes clay with his hands, he rubs it in the man's eyes and sends him off to wash. And lo and behold, this blind man comes back able to see. Now, I want you to imagine for a moment what that must have been like. In fact, for a moment, if you're watching along here at home, just shut your eyes. I, I promise I can't reach through the camera and steal your wallet. You can trust me on this one. Shut your eyes and imagine for a moment that this was your life. This was the only life you had ever known. You'd never seen the sunrise as it broke through the horizon. You'd never seen a, bo a bird as it spread out its wings and soared through the, through the sky. You'd never seen a smile or a tear for that matter roll down a person's face. In fact, you can't even imagine those things because you've never been able to see at all. Imagine if the only thing you'd ever known in this world was darkness. And then one day, this man called Jesus comes along and gives you sight. You can open your eyes now if you haven't dozed off, if you did do that while you were watching at home. This must have been just the most amazing, life-changing moment for this man, right? to see for the first time the, the world around him, to see his own hands, to see his face in the water as he came up out of it, to see the face of his mother and his dad and his family as for the very first time, light hits his eyes. Imagine, I imagine that must have just been pure and overwhelming joy for this guy, that having ever only known darkness, he now can see the light. This is an amazing thing that Jesus does for this man, isn't it? And yet, it's not the most amazing thing in this passage. In fact, the more amazing thing than what Jesus does in these verses is actually the words he says right before he does it. Look there again in chapter 9, verse 3. Neither this man nor his parents sinned, said Jesus, but this happens so that the works of God might be displayed in him. As long as it is day, we must do the works of him who sent me. And night is coming when no one can work. While I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Now, when you understand what Jesus is saying about himself here, it, it's just amazing. It's truly incredible. What he does is he opens the eyes of a man born blind. What he says is that he is the light of the whole entire world. In fact, that's, that's the whole point of why Jesus heals the blind man in the first place. That is, this is not just an, an amazing miracle. It's not even just a, a great act of kindness. It's more than that. It's a sign. It's a sign that's meant to point to something greater about Jesus. And what does this miracle, this sign point to? It points to the fact that in God, in Jesus, sorry, God makes the blind see. In Jesus, God has brought light into the darkness of this world. See, in a sense, this whole world is represented by this blind man. Because it too lives in darkness, the darkness of sin and death. In fact, that's one of the interesting things about Jesus' response to the disciples. Did you notice that he never says, the blind man's not a sinner? What he says is, the blindness isn't caused by his sin. Of course, this man's a sinner. We all are, aren't we? We've all turned our backs on God, the God who made us. We've all worshipped and served, created things above him. See, the state of this whole world and, and everyone in it 
is just like the state of the man born blind in this story. It does not know God. It does not see God, nor can it know God, nor can it see him. It is without hope. It is without life. It is living in darkness, the darkness caused by sin. That is until God sent Jesus. God sent Jesus into the world to be the light which pierces through the darkness of it and offers us the hope and joy of salvation, forgiveness of sins, eternal life with him. That is, if Jesus never came, if this whole story never happened, if, if God never sent Jesus into this world, then like this blind man, all the world would ever know is darkness. All it would ever know is the curse of sin and death. But in Jesus, the whole course of history changed forever in a moment as the light came down and broke in. You know, this is one of the reasons as a church we're so committed to the idea of missionaries, people going out across the world with the good news of the gospel, with the good news of Jesus. Because ultimately the, the answer to the problems of this world doesn't lie in education, politics, a, a vaccination or even things like social justice. Those things are good and they're wonderful and, and they make a real difference, right? But, but they cannot deal with the problem of sin and they'll never overcome darkness. What our world actually needs is to hear the good news of Jesus the answer to that problem of sin and death and darkness lies only in him. And I reckon with a, a new year kind of kicking off, getting underway, now might be the time, if you haven't already, for you and your family to, to sit down and work out who you want to pray for this year from our missionary team or, or even beyond it. At HBC, we support a whole bunch of missionary families, some of which you can see here on the screen, but it's not all of them. And they're in different places across the world doing different things. A lot of the details for that you can find out about on our HBC website. Why not sit down and make a plan to pray for them in your house or in your, your family and support them in this great work of taking the gospel to the world? Because that's what Jesus wants for this world, isn't it? And it's what he invites us to be a part of with him. Making known this light which shone in the darkness. And yet, even as I say this, we know that not everyone will accept this light, don't we? In fact, this passage shows us that so clearly. Because in this passage, what Jesus does and says, it actually has an interesting effect on those who see it. What it does is it causes everyone to be divided over him. Did you notice that as we read through the passage before? So in verses 8 to 12, the blind man's neighbours, those who know him and saw him begging, they can't quite believe what's happened. So some of them are sceptical as to whether it's really him. So they take him to the Pharisees, the Jewish religious leaders of the day, who end up kind of split down the middle over Jesus. Look there in verse 16. Some of the Pharisees said, this man is not from God, for he does not keep the Sabbath. But others asked, how can a sinner perform such signs? So they were divided. Even the parents of the blind man aren't quite sure what to make of all this. They obviously can't deny that this is their son, but they're afraid of what the Pharisees might do to them if they admit the reason he now sees is Jesus. So they kind of throw the responsibility back on their kids saying, well, you know, he's of age, he's old enough to answer. Ask him, let this guy tell you who he thinks Jesus is. In fact, all of this division, all of this skepticism and argument, right, it comes to a head in this big Barney, this big blow up at the end of this passage between the Pharisees and the man who was born blind but now sees. Look there again in, in verse 24. A second time, they summoned the man who had been blind. Give glory to God by telling the truth, they said. We know this man is a sinner. He replied, 
Whether he is a sinner or not, I don't know. One thing I do know, I was blind, but now I see. Then they asked him, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? He answered, I've told you already and you did not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you want to become his disciples too? Then they hurled their insults at him and said, you are this fellow's disciple. We are disciples of Moses. We know that God spoke to Moses, but as for this fellow, we don't even know where he comes from. The man answered, now that is remarkable. You don't know where he comes from, yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners. He listens to the godly person who does his will. Nobody has ever heard of opening the eyes of a man born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. And to this they replied, you were steeped in sin at birth. How dare you lecture us? And they threw him out. You see, even though the obvious point of what Jesus does and says here is that God has sent him as the light of the world, despite this clear evidence, still some people choose not to believe. In fact, as far as I can tell in this story, it's it's only the blind man himself who ends up trusting Jesus down there in verse 38. Others get close, they're, they're amazed at what happened, but only the blind man utters those words, Lord I believe. You see, Jesus has sent God to be the light of the world, but not many in the world will actually accept it. Not everyone who hears this message will choose to believe. In fact, what you see in this passage is that Jesus is is kind of like Nick Kyrgios. Whether you, whatever you think of Kyrgios, you've got to admit that the guy is an amazingly polarizing figure. Some seem to love him, some seem to hate him, and it seems like most people end up doing the latter. And in this passage, that's exactly what happens to Jesus. They either love him or they hate him. They're split down the middle by what he does and says. And look again, this is true of Jesus today as well, isn't it? Many people in our world, like the, like the Pharisees, they... They have this expectation of who God should be that Jesus doesn't fit and won't fit. I think for most people in our society today, they still think of Jesus as that kind of gentle Jesus, meek and mild, or or buddy Jesus, Jesus the good guy, Jesus my best friend. Christians, they have a problem with Christians, right? But Jesus, he's all right. He's a good guy. That is until they hear the words that he actually says about God, about life, about death, about sin. When they hear what he says about things like marriage, right? They see these claims like he's the light of the world, the only way that you can know God. And they think, well, why should I follow this guy? I don't like this version of Jesus. This doesn't fit my picture of God. I'm going to reject him. And I think this is why in this world we should expect people to reject Jesus. Uh, it breaks our hearts, but, but it doesn't catch us off guard. We should expect that many people still won't choose to believe in Jesus and, and will end up opposing, persecuting those who do. And it's not because there's not enough evidence It's in spite of the evidence. It's because of what Jesus claims about himself and this world. It's because of what Jesus does and says. It's because their version and their expectation of God doesn't fit with Jesus. And so they make a judgment about him. So the reality is that Jesus is the light of the world. But only some, like the blind man, will see and believe. Others will deny him and turn him away. They'll reject that he is who he claims to be. In fact, that's precisely the point of this whole passage. See, in John chapter 9, there's this incredible irony that that kind of runs throughout the whole story. At first glance, as you read it, it seems like everybody is making judgments about Jesus here, right? 
But by the time you get to the end of the story, you realise it's been the other way around the whole time. It's Jesus in this passage who ends up judging them. Is, have you ever wondered why Jesus doesn't just tell the blind man to see? Because, you know, he can heal with just his words. A couple of weeks ago, we saw Jesus made a man walk by just saying, rise. One word he said, and the guy got up and, and walked. So why doesn't he just do that here? Why go to all this effort of, of spitting on the ground and making clay from the dirt and then rubbing it in the man's eyes and telling him to go away and wash when he could have just as easily said to the man, see, and he would have. Well, I think it's because he knows by healing this man this way, it's actually going to catch the Pharisees out. By doing that physical work, right, of choosing to make clay with his hands from dirt and spit, Jesus knows the Pharisees will hear about that and they'll say that Jesus was working on the Sabbath. And only sinners, not those sent from God, could work on the Sabbath. So they'll end up rejecting who Jesus claims to be. That's what they say down in verse 16, as we read it before there, right? They say, this man is not from God, for he does not keep the Sabbath. Jesus could say to the blind man in this story, see, and he would, but he chooses to heal him in a way that is deliberately divisive, in a way that it would mean that he wouldn't fit the Pharisees' expectations of God. He wouldn't fit their idea of who God is and what he should be like. It's the exact same problem we saw they had with Jesus back in chapter 5 when he said rise. Like, Jesus does this amazing thing. He makes a man walk again and they're caught up in the fact that the guy is carrying his mat on the Sabbath. Their narrow-mindedness sees work, the work of sin here and they miss the obvious conclusion, the only obvious conclusion one should make in that moment that this man was in fact sent by God. Because who else can make the lame walk? Who else has the power to make the blind see? Jesus chooses to heal this blind man in a way that means that some people reject him. Because in their pride, they have this version of God, this expectation about who he should be that Jesus doesn't fit. And on the flip side, Jesus is the one who initiates every part of the process that leads to the blind man saying, I believe. So he sees the blind man in verse 1 that leads to that conversation with the disciples. He heals the blind man in verse 6 without the man even asking him to do it. In verse 35, did you notice it's Jesus who goes and seeks out the blind man, who finds the man he has healed again after the Pharisees have thrown him out after that fight. Jesus finds him and asks him, do you want to believe? That is, it is all Jesus in this passage who gives physical sight to this man. It's all Jesus who brings him and gives him that spiritual sight too, to see that he is the son of man, the light of the world, the one sent from God that he might believe. You see, we often make a really big mistake when it comes to approaching Jesus. We make the mistake of thinking that we are the ones who sit in judgment over Jesus, as if we're the center of the universe and we're the ones who matter and Jesus is out there and he's working for us. But we decide whether or not we want him and, and we determine if we think he is worth following. But in reality, this passage shows us it's the other way around. Jesus doesn't need us to follow him. We're not the center of the universe. He is. I mean, he, he wants us to follow him for our sake, for the sake of our souls. But, but it's not as if we can take or leave Jesus like it's on our terms. It's not as if he works for us. He's still God. He's still the judge. And, and he still sifts out the people of this world and determines this division through the things that he does and says. He wants you to come to him, but he wants you to come to him on his terms. In fact, 
That's precisely what Jesus himself says this passage is all about in verse 39. Jesus says, For judgment I have come into this world, so that the blind will see and those who see will become blind. Some Pharisees who were with him heard him say this and asked, What? Are we blind too? Jesus said, If you were blind, you would not be guilty of sin. But now you claim you can see, you think you know better than me, your guilt remains. Yes, Jesus is the light, but the light has dual purpose. For some, it shines in such a way that they see him for who he truly is and they worship him and they believe. But for others, he's a light that shines and causes them blindness. Because they end up denying that Jesus is the one sent from God. They reject his forgiveness and remain in the darkness. They reject his life and remain in their sins. And that is a challenging truth because it's incredibly humbling. It reminds us that salvation is not a birthright. It's, it's not our entitlement. It's the grace of the Lord Jesus. My default, as I think about this world and my friends and family who don't know Jesus, is to think that God is calloused because he hasn't yet saved them. But I suspect that's because I can't really grasp the horrendous nature of humanity's sin. What a horrific thing it is that people have chosen to rebel against God. And so I slip into this mindset where I think people deserve mercy. They're entitled to it. And I'm kind of angry at God, calloused in my heart that he hasn't saved them. And I forget the scandalous thing about Christianity is not that we have a God who judges the world. That's right. That's just. The scandalous thing about Christianity is that we have a God who would choose to save anyone. Now, I have to wrestle with that perspective. I have to wrestle to keep it if I'm being honest. But one thing I've been praying for this week is that God would help me to see what he sees, to see the world and those around him from his perspective. And I think I want to end up at a place where I'm praying for God to save those I love, believing, knowing he is able to do it, but not presuming upon him that he has to. Because what we all deserve is judgment. And it's by his grace that some are forgiven. And as Christians, as those who follow Jesus, this mind-boggling thing, this mind-boggling truth is that you have been given that grace. Our eyes have been opened to see the light of the world, not because we're special or because of greater intelligence, not because we're better people or somehow we deserve it, I believe in Jesus. You believe in Jesus because that's what he decided. In his great eternal plan, for whatever reason, he chose you and I. This passage reminds us of the incredibly humbling joy it is to be saved by him, to be plucked out of the darkness and brought into the light. See, as Christians, We say, there goes I, I am that blind man, but for the kindness and grace of God. Salvation is mine because Jesus came along and opened my eyes. I was blind. He made me see. It's so easy to become complacent about salvation, isn't it? And slip into taking it for granted, slip into taking God for granted. But this passage forces us to fall on our knees and, and worship Jesus just like the blind man does, just to lay our lives joyfully at his feet because once I was blind and living in darkness until Jesus, the light of the world, came and made me see. And you know, if that was just true for me, that would, that would still be cause for worship. But it's not just me, it's me and you and many people across our church. And it will happen today, it'll happen tomorrow, and every day until Jesus returns here in our city, in our country, across the world. Jesus, the light of the world, will continue to pour out his undeserved mercy. He'll continue to open the eyes of the blind to see. Not everyone. We know that. This passage confirms it. Many people will reject Jesus. We saw that too. But we can 
have confidence that people will become Christians as we speak about Jesus. That's what this passage shows us. He makes the blind see. And it's also what we've seen year after year after year at this church, isn't it? 27 people decided to follow Jesus last year at HBC. 27 people had their eyes opened. They saw the light of the world. Two people already since the start of this year, since January started, right? And these are not numbers. These are souls and they're rescued by Jesus. God all around us all the time is opening people's eyes and helping them to see. And he uses our prayers. He uses our conversations. He uses us to do it. So why not this year ask God for that? Ask God for opportunities to speak about Jesus, to tell people about the light of the world which has shone in the darkness. In fact, why not pray for an opportunity in the next few weeks as we lead up to the Life Series as a church to share your testimony? That's what the blind man does in this story, right? It's just a really simple strategy for sharing your faith. He just tells people, this is what Jesus did for me. This is why it is, I believe. And admittedly, in this story, it's not super effective. Most people we see end up rejecting Jesus. But I'm sure that as he continued to tell everyone what happened to him, how his life was turned around, some of those who heard him would have believed in him too, would have believed in Jesus and worshipped him. Now, if you've never written your testimony or thought about how to share it in a way that points to Jesus, we're going to post a really, great web, a really great resource on our website that you can look at and it'll help you prepare your testimony. It'll help you prepare it in such a way that it centers around Jesus and leads others to want to know more about him. Even if you've been a Christian your whole life, this will help you think about how you can share the story of what he's done in you with them in the hope that they too might believe. Why not sit down this week, maybe with your housemates or your, or your family, your spouse or kids, write out your testimony, write them out together and then pray for opportunities to share it even this week, to share it with someone around you in the hope you can invite them to the life series that's coming up. Because Jesus has come as the light of the world and he's opening the eyes of the blind, giving them eyes to see. See, what matters most in this world is clear sight about Jesus, the light of the world who opens the eyes of the blind, who brings sinners to salvation and makes the blind see. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for Jesus. We praise you for sending him into the world as the light of the world to shine in the darkness of sin and death and offer us hope of salvation, forgiveness, life eternal with him. Father, we know that many will reject the light because he doesn't quite fit their picture of who they think God should be. And yet, Father, this passage reminds us so clearly that it's you, that it's Jesus who opens the eyes of the blind who enables people to see who he really is, who enables people to believe. Father, we thank you that this is true for us who are Christians. We praise you so much for the joy of salvation. Please help us not to take that for granted. Please help us to see what an amazing thing it is that even though we, all we have ever known is darkness, you reached into our lives and opened our eyes. You gave us eyes to see Jesus for who he is and believe. And Father, we pray for our city. We pray for our our country. We pray for our world. Father, Jesus is not just the light of our lives. He's the light of the whole entire world. And we pray that you would give us a heart like yours, which longs to see people all across the world know that. Please help us to share our testimonies with those around us who don't know Jesus. 
And please help us to pray for missionaries who are out there making known Jesus to people all across the world. Knowing that in your great eternal plan, you're going to save people. You're going to open their eyes too, that they might see. And we ask all of this, Father, knowing that you are a good and wonderful God and praising you for everything you have done. In Jesus' name, amen. And no legacy survive unless the Lord does raise the house in vain, its builders strive to you who boast tomorrow's gain. Tell me what is your life amidst the vanishes. family. So my parents, they followed traditions, I guess, passed down by my grandparents. And yeah, so I did like rituals with them. And yeah, being a good kid, I wanted to please them. I went for Sunday school in the temple and yeah, I just basically followed all the rituals. And yeah, what I thought about God, 
I think um, I just thought that God was for weaker people and people who like struggle in life and had lots of problems. So I thought I was pretty good like without God. I was doing fine. Yeah, chill. I came to uni, I guess, with very little knowledge about Christianity and who Jesus was. And um, in my second year of uni, I got invited to um, All Nations Explored, which is where a group of international students gather um, to learn more about who Jesus is and what Christianity is in general. Yeah, I went there um, for one, oh no, probably a few sessions. But I remember clearly the first time I went in, probably without much expectations of what was going to happen. Um, I came out with lots of questions. And even though I um, was still really confused, like I was convinced that Jesus was real and that the Bible was trustable and, yeah, and valid, even in this day. Yeah, so I heard about the live series in one of the church services and decided to sign up for it. Um, yeah, and when I went there, I did not know anyone. And so it was really new and yeah, it was slightly scary when I first um, stepped into the hub. But I think everyone there was really um, friendly and they were very keen to like, I guess, know who I am and um, also know like um, my thoughts about Christianity at the start. I think the best thing about the live series was that um, it was able to consolidate all the questions that I had and um, really answer the bigger questions about Christianity and who Jesus is. And yeah, it convicted me even more because I was able to clearly see um, what the heart of Christianity is and, yeah, and who Jesus is and how important He is will be in my life, yeah. Um, the biggest thing would be that um, he loves me and he loves me so much that um, he actually, well, took all my sins and bore the punishment um, on himself. Um, yeah, and I think that is just an amazing love that I will never be able to uh, fully understand. Being loved is one thing but um, another would be that I did not deserve his love because um, I have always been uh, rejecting Jesus and rejecting God in my life and um, yeah not not actually knowing how much he has been doing for me and um, yeah how much he has loved me. It was so great to hear Yen's story there of how she met Jesus and how Jesus' love transformed her life completely. Now, if you're exploring Jesus for the first time, or if you know someone who is doing that, Yen mentioned the Life series um, and how it was pivotal to her investigating Christianity and having all her questions answered. Now, we would love to invite you to our next series that's starting on the 9th of February. Now you can sign up for the next series by sending a text to the number on the screen or you can go to the website at hunterbarberchurch.org forward slash life. Now we would love to see you there. Now I'm going to finish today by praying. So why don't you join me in prayer? Heavenly Father, we thank you for the work that you, did, that you have done in Yan's life and how you've transformed her life completely and now she lives for you and you alone. And Father, we pray for those who are sick with COVID um, or for people with families that are sick with COVID. I pray that you give them comfort um, and strength as they persevere through this um, difficult period. We pray for families as they send their kids to school this week. Um, there's lots of unknowns and uncertainties uh, with the situation that we're in, but we know that you are sovereign and over everything, that you have control over this. We pray that you help us to trust you through it all. We pray for our youth and rush teams and our uni church teams as they begin to prep for this um, hectic, busy start of year period. Um, but it's also so exciting. Uh, we pray for all these ministries that you will have your hand over, the, over them. And we pray that all these leaders um, and people that are serving you will serve you faithfully 
um, and with all humility because they love Jesus. We pray all this in his name. Amen. Well, thank you so much for joining us um, and I'll see you next week.